Do you want to brush up data structures and algorithms in just one hour? Well, this crash course is designed for you. Hi, my name is Pratik Naran and in this tutorial, we will be quickly revisiting many fundamental concepts associated with data structures like arrays, dynamic arrays, linked list, stack, queue, hash map, priority queue and much more. Not just that, we will be also exploring Java's collection framework to use these data structures in solving problems and building real software. We will do many hands-on examples that will solidify your understanding of these concepts. But before we get started, make sure to check out free masterclasses on Scalar's event page to learn from the best industry leading experts. The link is in the description below. Also make sure you hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. All right, so let's begin with the tutorial. Let us start by revisiting the concept of a data set. A data structure is a meaningful way of arranging and storing data inside the memory of the computer that is your RAM. Okay, we are not talking about your physical memory, we are talking about your volatile memory in which your algorithm will execute and it will do some certain operations like insertion, deletion, searching and removal of data. We have different data structures and they are optimized for different kind of operations that we can do and different kind of orderings we can do on that data, right? So some of the data structures you might have heard about arrays, stacks, queues, hash tables, trees and graphs. Every data structure has its own uh, properties, own way of ordering data, own way of implementing these operations. We'll try to understand how these data structures are different and how we can use them in Java as well. Broadly speaking, they are divided into two categories. We have linear data structures, we have non-linear data structures. There is one more category I would say we have associative data structures in which we store data in the form of key value pairs. For example, your hash maps. We will talk about hash maps later in this course. Those linear data structures, they can be of fixed size like a fixed size array or they can be dynamic. That means they can grow and shrink in size. For example, your array list, your linked list, your stack, your queue. In non-linear data structures, we might have data structures which have a hierarchical structure. For example, your trees also have data structures which have network like data structure. For example, this is a very high level overview of how data structures are classified. But let us start by revisiting the importance of data structures in our real life. So suppose you go to a grocery store and you find everything is disorganized. Then it would become very difficult for you to search for a given item. But if your items are organized across racks and categories, you will easily find a particular item that you're looking for, right? So keeping data organized makes certain operations like your searching faster, right? Similarly, if you go to tickets and if there is no queue, then it would be very unfair for the people to wait randomly, right? But if people are organized on the basis of their priority, the person who is coming first and he's getting the uh, queue ticket first, then it is called as FIFO ordering, right? Similarly, in data, we might require FIFO ordering. So queue is a data structure that provides us with this kind of a ordering, right? And let us look at one more example. Sometimes I go to a restaurant, I, I say, okay, I want to order a burger. Right? Then I quickly get an answer that the burger cost is rupees 100. What is happening for every item, there is a value attached to it, right? So for every key, there is a value, right? So the data can might be stored in the form of key value pairs. And this is where some other data structures like hash maps come into the picture, right? Another example could be that if I'm on my system and I'm locating certain files, right? I know that, okay, in this folder, I have kept this kind of a data in this folder. I've kept my PDFs in this folder, in this drive, I've kept my pictures, right? So what is your file system? The file system is a tree like structure. You start with your, my computer, you go to your drive, then you go to certain folders and you find the files that you're looking for, right? You do not organize this data in the form of hierarchy and if so I'll search the whole computer it would be very inefficient for you and you will spend a lot of time searching for a given file right so the file system is also an example of a tree like data structure so that means we use data structures a lot in our daily life in building software applications so in real world also the meaningful structuring of items helps businesses operate efficiently we saw the example of grocery store so similarly, data structures allow us to execute certain operations like insertion, deletion, searching, updates on the data very efficiently. And that this data is stored inside the memory of the computer. 
Now, depending on the problem that we are trying to solve, we select a suitable data structure that fulfills our requirements. This is the goal of this video. In this lecture, we are going to understand how, according to different requirements, what data structure we will use, and we will look at its implementation using Java Collections framework. Right? Now, you might ask, okay, that's data structure. What is an algorithm then? Algorithm is the main logic. It is the step-by-step, -step, unambiguous set of instructions for solving a problem. Right? We can define algorithms for real life scenarios like making a pack of noodles. You might say, okay, take a pan, put two cups of water inside it, boil something, something. That list of instructions is an algorithm to make a pack of noodles. Or maybe something complex like if I want to play a Ludo game or if I want to make an algorithm that suggests the best photo out of a set of photos, we can devise an algorithm for that. So in real world, from every uh, every deterministic action, for example, your washing machine, a self-driving car, all the actions your machines are taking, that can also be expressed using an algorithm. Right? In the software world, all the apps that you're using, photo editing app, scrolling Instagram, browsing Netflix, uh, in a cargo hub, sorting of shipments, detecting collisions in games, transferring money through UAPI, ordering food, there is an algorithm behind every action that we perform so that is why it is very important for us to learn data structures and algorithm right and when we combine data structures along with the algorithms we build products that can solve real life problems that is an importance of data structures and algorithms i will start with arrays let us start with the array which is the simplest and the most widely used data structure so i am hoping most of you have must have worked with an array what is an array array is a linear collection of elements of the same type so this is true for Java, other languages like Python, they also support heterogeneous arrays. That means you can put different number, different types of data, for example, integer, string, float inside one array. Arrays are used to store multiple values in a single variable. So let's say this is a container, which is linear. That means it will occupy linear block of memory. For example, if this address is 104 and this bucket takes four, uh, four bytes, then the next address will be 108 next address will be 112 right so it is a linear block of memory right? and this whole block of memory has a single name right and each element if i want to access it can be accessed using an index the indexing starts with zero so i can say okay i want to put something at array of zero then i will say array of zero it, it is four if i want to overwrite it i will say okay array of uh, three it's going to be 20 so i can just overwrite this data and it will keep 20 here, right? Each array location is accessed using an index. The indexing starts from zero. That is what we have just seen. So you have the array name followed by the index. This is how you access the ith location inside an array, right? Now, uh, let us look at some examples of an arrays. For example, if I want to create an array of strings in which I'm calling the variable as bill payments, so I have uh, define three strings electricity mobile and credit card right and i have an array of numbers i have defined four numbers here i have int followed by square brackets followed by name of the array this is a very simple way of creating an array but you can also create an array of fixed size where you have not given your data right in the previous scenario we have not defined the size size will depend upon how many um, items we have initialized in this list right so you can directly initialize or you can first create a fixed size block. You can say, okay, I want an array that is able to hold five integers. We'll use the new keyword followed by the data type and followed by the size. So what happens? It creates an array. So if I talk about Java, the variable ARR, it most likely it goes into your dark memory and the actual array that we have this, this is created in the deep memory, right? ARR we call as a object reference. ARR is holding the address of this array. ARR is going to hold 104. ARR is in the stack, whereas this actual object, it is in the deep memory. Now we are updating the data at the ith index. We are actually storing 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50 here. This is how you create an array. And all the array objects, they have a length property added to it so if you say okay this is a cars area and i want to say cars dot length this will give me okay how many objects are stored in this array or what is the size of this array this will give me 
4, right? The size of this array. And using the length property, I can also iterate over the arrays, right? So I can say, okay, let me go over every index from 0 till cars.length. That means I'm iterating from 0, 1, 2, 3. The length is 4. So I'm iterating over these indices. And I'll say, okay, let me print every car. I will print the ith object, right? That is one way of iterating using the length property. You can get the size. Other ways you can use a for each loop or also called as enhanced for loop. You can say, okay, for every string value that is there inside my um, cars array, I want to go over that value and I want to print it. That is another way of iterating over the complete array object. Then let's talk about the advantages of arrays. They are very simple and they are very easy to use. The insertion is really fast at the end of the array because if you keep a variable that, okay, these positions are filled. I want to put something here. You can simply say array of i equal to value. So that value will get stored here. So you can insert at the end of the array very fast and array element can be accessed in a constant time. So if you want to get this element, you can simply say, okay, give me the jth element. So you can access any random element, any random index in just order one time. That is an advantage of an array. But they also have certain disadvantages. The thing is arrays have fixed size. So once you create an array, okay, new int of some size 10, you cannot say I will make it 15 or I will make it 20. They have a fixed size. They cannot grow in memory once they are allocated. Insertion in the middle requires shifting of the elements. If you have inserted something, let's say one, two, four, six, eight, and you say, okay, I want to insert three. What you will have to do, you will have to shift these elements to the right. Then you can insert three in the middle. So it's going to take order of n time for doing the insertion. Right? And second thing is, since array requires a linear memory block, such blocks might not be available if the array size is big. Suppose this is your heap memory. And suppose certain portions of the heap memory, they are already used up. right? And suppose you want to create a very big array, which might go like this. Now it is possible that such a linear block of memory is not available, but this amount of memory is available in the heap in chunks, right? So you might say, okay, some memory is available here. Some memory is available here. Some memory is available here. That is where linked list might perform better because linked list does not need big linear chunk of the memory, whereas array requires a le big linear chunk of the memory, right? So for big arrays, it could be a disadvantage that such a linear block could not be present in the memory. Now arrays are used a lot in the real world. For example, this is a UI from a shopping website where I have to display these components, right? the type of bill payments. Now I can say, okay, each bill payment is a string. So I have a fixed size array of bill payments in which I have defined all the categories, right? Now you might say, okay, uh, this looks very simple. In actual world, it might be a bit more complicated. Yes, it can be. What may happen is that each item is not just a string, but it is a um, something more complex. Let me call this as a payment category. What I can do, I can define a class called as payment category, which hold three things. Maybe the category ID, which is not displayed, the category name and the image of the category, right? The URL of the image of the category. Right? So I can hold all these things inside a class and then I can create an array of uh, the following class. I can say, okay, I'm creating an array where each item is of the type payment category, right? So I'm creating an array of objects of the type payment category. Right? I have initialized this array that is going to contain 14 items and I, I need to create these objects as well. I need to say, okay, the bill payments of zero, it is going to hold new payment category and using the constructor, I've initialized these values. Okay, the payment category is one. The name is electricity and some URL. So instead of creating an array of primitive data types such as integer or float, we can also create an array of complex data types such as payment categories in this example, right? Secondly, there are two dimensional arrays as well, which are also used a lot, especially in games and puzzles, right? So here is an example of tic-tac-toe where we might need a board right? or here is an example of Sudoku game where might we might need a two dimensional array to represent the state of the game, right? So it's a nine cross nine array. So I've created this array, right? And I can also create a list of players. It's going to be a 1D array, but the data type is now a player, right? 
each player might have a name it might have a score might have certain uh, methods associated with it right it's an array of players right that is also how arrays can be used another use case could be that array can also be part of a data member of a class for example you have an enemy object the enemy has certain bullets inside it like certain number of bullets the enemy can fire i can create an array of bullets where each bullet is of the type bullet and i have created it when the enemy is created for example i want this enemy to have exactly six, six bullets when this enemy is created i can do something like this okay and when you are firing the bullet maybe a particular bullet might get deactivated something like this can also be possible where your array is a data member of a particular class this can also happen right another example could be your the your uh, images right so when you deal with images you know each image is made up of a matrix of pixels okay of the size rows into columns so you might have heard about an hd image so that is 1920 by 1080 that simply means that we have these many pixels in this image and each pixel is actually made up of three numbers a component of red component of green and a component of blue so that means each pixel itself is a array of three numbers right if i look at an image the image is actually a three dimensional array of rows comma columns into three right where each pixel is actually going to store three numbers right when we do with work with images in python we often see the arrays are three dimensional okay another example that when you are building uh, software components for example a tool like photoshop right you will say okay there is this grid where every item is a tool so i can say okay tool toolbox this is new tool and in every index i am creating a new tool right marquee tool is a type of a tool move tool is a type of a tool right i can also do something like this they are used a lot in building real life software and that is the importance of arrays right now we'll look at some code demo to work with arrays now we are going to look at some code of an arrays especially how do we perform an operation like sorting on arrays which comes very ha handy in solving lot of problems okay so i have uh, an array of numbers and i want to use a method called as sort right so in java dot util package there is a class called arrays right so this class contains methods that will work on a array that we have created right arrays dot sort is one such method we want to use this method to sort our numbers array let's see if i uh, go and run this code so i just need to call this function f1 so my array is created the array will get sorted and we are going to output this array right another such method is arrays dot to string i can convert this array into a string like representation that i can print directly so let us just go and run this main method so now you see the data that you are getting is in a sorted order let us look at one more example let's say i have an array of strings and i want to sort these strings again what i can do i can use arrays dot sort method which is again a inbuilt method inside java dot util and i just need to pass the array object to this method so it's going to sort these objects and let us call our function f2 and let us run this code now what do i see i see an output apple banana grape lemon and orange right now how two strings are compared let us talk a little bit about comparisons as well now comparing numbers is easy i can compare as 5 less than 13 the answer is yes right but if i have a string called as let's say uh, s1 that is abc and i have string s2 let's say i call it as abe right now are they equal or are they not equal how do we compare by default inside the string class there is a method called as compare to if i say s1 dot compare to you see there is a suggestion coming out and i say okay let me compare it with the string s2 and let me uh show you the output of what this comparison function is going to return right now why i'm teaching you is this is very important because we also want to write custom comparisons for our objects i'm getting an output that is minus basically 
how sorting function works is internally calls the compare to method when you use arrays uh, dot sort and you give um, some array of objects to sort right so what it does it calls the compare to method of that object so string basically it is calling the compare to method of this object so i'm saying s1 which is abc i want to compare it with another string abe now this compare to method it's going to produce three types of outputs one is a negative output one is zero and another is positive so negative output simply means that my first number is smaller first object is smaller that means it will come first in the list positive number means my second object is smaller that means it will come first in the list and zero means the two objects they are actually equal if if i get a negative output which i'm getting in this case that means abc is smaller than abe let us also see how this minus 2 is actually coming right so when you compare uh, abc with abe right so you compare a with a they are equal so you move to the next position you go with b b and b they are equal you move to the next position now you compare c and d right now suppose c has some ascii value right so maybe this is uh, this was 97 98 99 right and this is 97 98 99 100 101 right the ascii value of e could be 101 so when you take this difference right, i think a is, a is actually 90 not 97 so whatever the ascii value is right you will take the difference if you subtract c from e you will get a difference of mine that basically tells the sorting function that i will place abc first and then i will place ab the sorted order so compare to function is responsible for defining the sorting order when i'm sorting these fruits you see apple banana grape lemon and orange they are coming in their dictionary order right because a string knows a compare to function is present inside it right then i say okay i want to i want to reverse this order right what you can do is one simple way of doing it is that you supply a custom comparator called as collections or reverse order that is exactly going to reverse the default output okay by default you're getting this output if you specify this it's going to reverse the default output if i run this code now you will see i will get orange first followed by lemon grape banana and apple that is one thing that you can use to uh, convert your ascending array into a descending that is one way of doing it so now you might ask then why we are studying this compared to method or where do we need it let us try to understand that as well this was very simple this was an array of integers or an array of strings right now you might say that i have a custom object i i have let's say a class called as employee where my employee has a name age and salary right and i want to create an array of uh, employees so i have a array of employees the array of custom objects and i want to sort them now if you uh, sort them right and if you do not tell java that okay i do not know how do we, how do i compare to employees most likely you are going to get an error right now arrays dot sort can also accept employees but given that you define a method called as compare to inside the employee class okay. in the string class it is an inbuilt method but in the employee class which we have written we have to define how do i compare to employees for example i have an employee e1 i want to call the compare to method and supply it some another employee e2 right so when you say okay i am sorting a list of employees right this is an array of employees so it will say okay I'm going to compare this employee with some other employee. So I will say employee i dot compare to some other employee that is employee j. Right? So the sort function is internally going to call this method called compare to. Right? Now this method is not there. What we have to do? We have to define this method inside our employee. I have my employee class, and here I'm going to define my compare to method. How it will get called? It will get called internally. So employee i getting compared to with some other employee j, right? Now, 
it is up to you how do you compare to employees right some other employee okay right emp now look at this how do i write this method so basically what i'm doing i'm saying if the two employees have the same age i will compare them according to their salary i'm saying salary 1 minus salary 2 so if, if the first employee salary is 100 and second employee salary is let's say 60 100 minus 60 it's going to produce a positive number that means the second employee will come first the person with the lesser salary will come first or if the age is not equal i'm saying age minus employee dot age so this is the age of the first employee and this is the age of the second employee for example if the first employee is 50 years old the second employee is 40 years old 50 minus 40 it's also going to produce a positive number that means the second employee it is smaller in age right so what this sort function is going to do what this compare function is going to do it's simply going to compare the two employees based upon their age if their ages are equal it's going to compare according to their salary people with the less age and less salary they are given priority they will come first in the output so let us run this code and see what do we uh, really get right okay one more thing is that uh, we have to so whenever you are creating this class we have to tell that it implements the comparable interface right why because the sort function ex expects that you will implement a compare to method this compare to method is coming from the comparable interface right we will discuss the concept of interface very shortly but you should know that uh, you have to say this class implements the comparable interface for the employee in which we have an abstract method compared to and we have defined this method in the current employee class right the body must be given here so what what is happening now uh, let me show you the output let's run this one we are sorting an array of object right so i'm saying let me print employees so now i'm getting 6025 this is salary and age uh i'm getting 12025 that means higher salary same age right? then i'm getting uh 8045 according to my logic the first preference is on age employees are sorted first on their age 25 25 45 and 56 then they are sorted on their salary if the age is same so Jam, uh, Jamin and Aryan they have the same age so the person with less salary it's going to come first so you can do you can make any logic like depending upon the situation and this compare to method will tell the sort function how do I actually sort so I'm hoping that this is clear. So one way is use the default sort function, but it does not work for the custom objects, right? Then what you can do, you can write the compare to method. And now there is one more scenario in which you might not want to go this way. You might want to go, go with the comparator way, right? Let me discuss that as well. So let us discuss one, one more way of sorting using comparator. Now I'm going to tell you why it could be important. Now suppose you have maybe a list of strings if let's say a b c or let's say some fruits apple mango guava and orange and you want to say okay i want to sort my fruits i want to say okay um arrays dot sort i want to sort fruits but i want to sort fruits maybe according to the dictionary order i want to use the default comparison or maybe i want to sort fruits uh, according to their length i'm not writing writing the proper code but what i'm trying to tell you is that if i want to sort fruits according to their length i will have to go inside the string class and inside the string class i will have to change the compare to method do you think changing the compare to method inside the string class which is implemented in the java library will be a good thing the answer is no we cannot go and uh, make changes in the library right that is one reason we will not use the default compare to method or we need some other way to do the sorting so that 
we have the flexibility right another option could be another reason could be that uh i might have a if else like this if the condition is this i want to sort according to some criteria if there is some other condition then i have to use some other criteria for sorting right i might have something like this then also i will have to say that okay go with the first way if your if condition is true go with the second way if your second condition is true. something of this sort what i'm going to tell you is that in such scenarios where either you have conditional sorting or you will have to uh, use your you cannot go and change the library compared to method for a for that particular class there is third way of doing the sorting so that way is called as comparator so i'll show you an example of using a comparator right in this case i am creating an array list of integers so array list we will study very shortly it's just like a array but it's dynamic in size it can grow and shrink so it is part of collections framework we will study so the teach the the demo that we, i'm going to do here is also applicable for arrays dot sort method what we have done is we have created a dynamic array in which i have added few numbers what i want to do is instead of sorting these numbers directly right i know 10 is less than 22 that's okay but what i want to do i want to sort these numbers based upon their sum of their digits you might say okay how do i override such a comparison in such scenario there is this third way that i'm going to teach you it is called as sorting using comparator right what we can do we can we still need to call the sort method if it is an array object you will use arrays dot sort but if it is an array list which is part of your collections framework you will use collections dot sort in this sort method you need to give your array list object that is a that that we have given right? and now you have to say that okay i'm creating a new comparator object it's an anonymous object we are not giving it any and in this object we have to override the compare method right so i'll just uh, write this part again once you will see uh, if you're using intellij it will come using the auto complete feature i create a new comparator object and in this it automatically creates a method called as public int compare note that it is not compared to this method it's going to accept two objects that you want to compare and you want to tell how do i compare these two objects okay so if there are simple strings so integer o1 integer o2 so let's say first object a is 10 b is 20 right? if you simply return a minus b that will simply compare these strings based upon their values that means okay 10 minus 20 sorry o1 minus o2 first object minus second object i can do that right? that will say okay 10 minus 20 it's a negative number that means 10 will come first but if i do it other way if i say uh, i will negate this entire comparison that means i am doing o2 minus o1 that means this list will be sorted in the descending order but suppose if i want to do based upon the sum of their digits okay for example this is 10 the so sum is 1 plus 0 that is 1 2 plus 2 that is 4 4 plus 1 5 4 plus 0 that is 4 35 3 plus 5 8 5 plus 1 that is 6 i want to sort according to this what i can do i can convert an integer into its sum right what i have done i have written a function called as get sum given an integer x i want to get the sum right so this is very easy you know how to find the sum of an integer when i'm making a comparison what i will do else okay i'll get the sum of first integer object i'll say get sum of a and i will subtract get sum of a is my object o1 and b is my object o2 if i do this what's going to happen so numbers whose sum is lesser right so i'll just comment this code out i'll show you the output i'll show you the output let us run this code once right this comparator is telling the sort function that now you have to compare the objects using the following criteria okay so I, i've printed it, it twice now if you look carefully 1 plus 0 is 1 this is 4 this is 4 this is 5 this is 6 and this is 8 
Now you look carefully at these numbers. They are sorted according to their sum. That is something that you can do, right? You can do the same thing with strings as well. You can do the same thing with employee as well. You do not want to uh, implement the compare to method inside the employee class. You can use a comparator. Or you want that on the top of it, I need another comparison based upon certain condition, right? If employees are uh, near their performance period, I want to compare according to their salaries, not according to their age. Right? So you can have that. Comparator gives you another option to do the sorting, right? You might say, okay, this looks a uh, little tricky. Is there a shorter, easy, easier way to do it? The answer is yes. So what we can do, we can use something called as a Lambda function as well. I'll just tell you in a very short way. What is a Lambda function? It's a one line function. It's an anonymous function. So in Java, what do you have to do? You have to write the inputs that you need to compare in these round brackets. For example, if I'm comparing two objects A and B right? and with an arrow, you have to write the output of the comparison. Right? Now, if you want to compare A and B in this case, what is the output? I'm saying, okay, get sum of A minus get sum of B. That is what we are doing in the compare function as well. That thing you put it here and this becomes a Lambda function and it will do the trick for you, right? So you can just say that, okay, I don't want to write the compare method. I just want to use this value that is the output and use these numbers that are my inputs. Given these two inputs, I want to return this output from the comparison. This will also work. And if I show you, if I comment this code out, this Lambda function will also do the same sorting thing that we want to do. Let us sort them and let's see what do we get. We are still getting the same out. That is another way of doing the sort. So hopefully now you have understood the three different ways of doing sort. And that's all for sorting. And we'll start with the collections framework next. Let's talk about Java collections framework now. So Java collections framework is a framework in Java that provides us with set of classes, interfaces to manipulate, organize and perform operations on data without writing your own data structures from scratch. So it provides you with library implementation of data structures and their associated methods that can do anything that you will ever need to do, right? That means you will be using inbuilt data structures because they come very handy when you're solving problems or you're building real life software. These data structures are also highly optimized and they will of course save a lot of development time. So you don't need to write your own hash table. You don't need to write your own linked list, right? So this is what is a standard practice. We will, most of the times we would be using the library implement. Just to summarize once again, what do we have? We have set of interfaces. We'll see. We have implementation classes, the classes that actually implement those interfaces. And we have also algorithms. Okay. So I showed you the examples of uh, arrays dot sort method, collection dot sort method. Similarly, we have methods for searching like binary search available in the Java collections. So you can just go and look at what all those methods are. But for now, what I will be doing, I will be doing a quick demo of interface versus a class so that you can really understand how these interfaces and classes are being organized inside the Java collections, right? So let us jump into a small code demo to understand the concept of interface versus a class. In this uh, example, what I have done, I have defined an interface called as a payment method. Okay? So what is an interface? An interface specifies what a class must do and not how. That means we do not have the implementation of the pay method. We do not know how to make the payment, but we are saying there must be something called as a pay if it is a payment method. Any payment method that we have must implement a pay method inside it. So it is a blueprint for, for the class. Interface methods are abstract by default. So they, they don't have any code inside. Now suppose I have, I'm going to create payment method called as debit card. So debit card is a class which implements payment method. That means now debit cast must define a pay method. So for now, I'm just saying that debit card pay method 
prints paying via debit card similarly i have one more class called credit card which also implements the payment method in i have one more uh, class called upi which also implements the payment method all these classes they have the pay method and they are implementing the payment method they are different ways of creating the payment method execution of each payment method would be different okay a credit card might have a different mechanism a upi might have a different mechanism of making the payment debit card will have a different mechanism of making the payment why we are doing this let us try to understand now suppose we have a method called as make payment and this method can accept any payment method i am not hard coding here i am not saying that i will only accept debit card dc i will not accept debit card i can accept any payment method one thing is we need a, a general structure we need a general data type that can hold all payment method okay and here i am going to call pm dot pay so now why this method will work so let me show you how do you create objects of it so i can say okay debit card dc this is equal to new debit card and i say okay uh, i am creating a debit card then i can call dc dot pay so this will work i am creating a debit card object dc dot pay will actually work right so i am uh, not calling this method as of now but what i can do is i can call the ma uh, make payment method and i can pass it the debit card object why because debit card object implements the payment method interface right? a better way to do it is suppose you have like some code here you say dc dot pay suppose uh, your debit card is not working or the debit card service is down or there is some issue right? and you want to make it change it to the credit card okay you want to say okay no i want to try credit card now if you do this this is going to give you a problem because a debit card data type cannot hold a credit card right but what we can do is we can use a more general data type that is payment method payment method is pm i can say okay on the left side i'll have a payment method which is implemented by a credit card right so payment method is a more general data type so this is a good design practice as well so this data type we will keep it more generic and this is a specific class that provides implementation of methods defined in this class this is a specific class now this could be credit card this could be debit card this could be upi right and i can pass the this object pm to any method make payment right now it does not care whether it i am going to call the pay method of debit card credit card upi whatever is the object passed it will call uh, the pay method of that object so that means with minimum change in code we can achieve this general uh, general behavior right so any payment method object will work inside the make payment method if i go and run this code i will show you what's going to happen it will say okay i'm going to make a payment using a credit card paying by a credit card but if i say okay no i will make it upi so without changing your make payment method you have just changed this object it will pay via upi right I'm going to run this code now paying via upi that means this uh, object reference can hold any object like any object which implements the payment method interface that is a quick revision about interfaces and classes in java and collections framework heavily uses this concept of interfaces and classes a lot so let us look at how this is implemented in the collection framework as well there are so many components inside collection framework there are interfaces there are classes there are child interfaces there are child classes and the hierarchy is a bit complex so what i've done is i've drawn a simplified diagram so that you can understand how these components are related so on the top we have something called as a collection interface okay so collection is a interface inside collections framework there are three more interfaces which are child interfaces of the collection interface so they, they are list set and queue they all extend the collection interface okay queue extends collection set extends collection 
and list also extends collection that means some methods are there in collection and list adds some additional methods which are specific to the list set adds more methods which are specific to the set queue adds more methods which are specific for the queue like behavior right? and then there are implementation classes which actually implement a list so array list implements a list the other way the array list is going to implement a list a link list is also going to implement a list stack is also going to implement a list vector is also going to implement a list so a vector is a concurrent data structure that means um, if there if you need to work if need you need to share this data structure across multiple threads then vector is the synchronized data structure okay, so we are not going to do concurrent data structures in this tutorial so i will leave vector at the moment similarly hash set implements the methods of the set linked list implements linked hash set implements methods of the set and tree set also implements methods of the set right now what is the difference the way these methods internally work that is different okay a tree set might use something like a self balancing binary search tree whereas hash set might use the concept of a hash table to store the data right so the implementation of methods is different and their time complexities they are also different right? so for queue we have three implementations we have array deck which is a doubly ended queue we have a linked list which is like your uh, which serves as your fifo linked list and there is a priority queue which again internally uses a heap like data structure to give priority to the elements which should come first right so we have interfaces and we have classes that implement those interfaces the ones that are in the orange they are the classes the ones which are in yellow they are the interfaces right so i hope you understood this simple hierarchy now you might be wondering where is hash map hash map is not a part of collection interface it is not a subtype of a collection interface it has been kept separately and it behaves differently from the rest of the collection types so that means uh, the map will be treated differently so map is a interface that we will look and hash map tree map and linked hash map they are the implementations for the map interface right we will use one of these implementations if you want to build a something like a map which can store key value pairs so we'll understand the differences between these implementations as we go through this tutorial right so let me uh, tell you a little more about collection interface the collection interface it it's a general interface it represents a group of objects which are known as elements right so it's it's simply grouping different objects and it is used to pass around collections of objects where maximum generality is required okay you just want a group of objects you don't want to use specific priority queue method or specific queue method or you don't want to use specific hash map method right so you just want some general methods that i should be able to add into the collection i should be able to remove from the collection i should be able to delete from the collection right for example you have a collection of string now this collection again it might be implemented using a linked list it might be implemented using a set it might be implemented using a array list we don't know right so we have to provide one way implement or represent this group of strings right so let me show you a code demo here so i have collection of string s1 now this interface uh, collection is an interface so i need a class to implement it so i'll say okay this collection will be stored using a array list so i'm adding something into the array list right i'm saying s1 dot add hello s1 dot add world right now you might ask where is this add method defined so i will tell you the collection interface contains method that performs basic operation okay so such as size every data structure you need to get its size every data structure should know whether it is empty or not every data structure should know whether a particular object is present inside it or not every data structure should support that i want to add some element i want to remove some element i need a iterator right it also contains methods that operate on entire collections such as add all given another collection can i add all the elements of the, this collection into the current collection yes i can right remove all retain all clear right these are general methods that are defined in the collection interface that means all the implementation classes will have to define these methods 
let me show you uh, something here so let us say i create one more collection and this collection is implemented using a hash set now in this hash set i am adding few uh, strings a b c and d right now this add function is going to behave differently from this add function because this add function is implemented by the array list but this add function is implemented by the hash set so if i print s1 and s2 i would be able to see okay there are two group of elements okay if i just run this code i'll say okay i have a collection s1 and i have a collection s2 now suppose i want to add all elements of s1 into s2 can we do that of course i can do that because the collection interface gives me methods like add all so s1 dot add i can give any collection here i can give list i can give array list i can give queue right i can say okay uh, in my hash set i want to add all elements of array list that is s1 so i can pass another collection into my add all method the method is add all right so it's a general method any collection can be passed to right this is what it means right method is add all that's correct so let's go and run this code now if i see a b c d it's here i will also see hello world is also there so you can see all elements of s1 they got added into s2 right all these general methods they are defined in the collection inter okay i hope you are understanding it so that is at the top right now why we are learning this because we want to use this data structures to solve problems efficiently it is so powerful that we can do lot of things for example we can create a list in which we can keep adding to we just saw an example of array list we can search items very quickly inside a hash map we can sort a list of students by using a comparator right we have just seen comparators we can also find topmost ordered items using a priority queue we can filter out duplicate elements using a hash set we can build a rate limiting algorithm using a queue right we can do lot of stuff using the collection framework and that is why we are learning it now next we will dive into specific classes and the first class that we will start is array list so let us talk about array list so array list is like a dynamic array for storing elements it's an array but with no size limit that means if an array gets full it will grow in size and it can accommodate more elements till you have memory available inside your heap right so array list class uh, it's a dynamic array it maintains the relative insertion order so if you add element it will always get added at the end so that means will get the same order as insertion we can add or remove elements even we can search for elements and it implements linear search that means it will take linear time to search it so in java it implements the list interface so we saw that list is a interface and array list is a implementation of the list interface all the methods that are available in the list interface are implemented by array list right so now how it is going to work internally so i'll give you a quick idea so internally it uses a fixed size array only right so it starts with some fixed size array so in java the default size is 10 so by default it will create a new array of size 10 and as soon as the array gets full it will double the size of the original now that doubling cannot happen in the same place suppose th this array was full right what it will do it will create a new linear array suppose this size was 10 it will create a new array of size 20 and it will copy all these elements into the new array right? and then you will have some extra buckets for new elements once this gets full it will again delete the previous array it will create a new array of double the size copy elements here and delete this array as well this is how it happens copy the elements from the old array in the new array and delete the old this is how this array actually works that means the doubling of the array list is a expensive operation and we should reduce the frequency of this doubling how do we do that so if you know you are going to store 1000 elements create an array list of initial size 1000 if if you by chance exceed 1000 the doubling will happen the array size will become 2000 right so it's good idea to start with the some initial size that is equal to your requirement so in java this doubling procedure is little different it says okay i'll maintain something called as a load factor this load factor is i think around 0.7 that means if 70% of your array is full 
the doubling will get triggered so we will not wait till uh filling of 100 percent of the array if 70 percent of the array gets full the doubling gets uh, the doubling function it's it's triggered okay so after adding the seventh element if the initial size was 10 a new array is created with a capacity of 20. so there are two things when you talk about size of the array list it tells you how many elements are currently stored in the array list so if you use the size method it's not the capacity capacity is generally more than the size right so capacity is how how much space has been allocated internally whereas size is the number of elements that we have stored in the array list right so what are the features it is dynamic in size it can grow and shrink in size secondly it is ordered it preserves the order of elements third it is index space just like an array you have indices array list also have indices if you want to access a particular element so okay i want to get this ith element you do not write array of i instead you write array list dot get i give me the ith element so get is a method that we, you will use to access any ith element so this also works in order one time right indexing is zero based so another property you need to know is it is object based array list can only store object data types that means it cannot be used with primitive data types you cannot create an array list of int float etc then you might be wondering how do we uh, create an array list of integers for that you have to use wrapper classes in java the wrapper class for int is called as integer so you will always create an array list of the data type integer not as int and secondly it is not synchronized that means it's not a concurrent data structure if you need if concurrency is important for your application you have to use vector which is the synchronized version of array list right so array list operations are not thread safe and multiple threads should not operate on the same array list so this is a basic data success tutorial if you want to learn about advanced concepts we will cover it in some other video right so what are the operations we can get any element using the get function we can add any element using the add function we can also add more elements using the add all function so i give you a list i want to add it i can use add all right I can give some element X that can be added insertion and deletion in the middle. It's going to take order of n time. So if you insert something in the middle, right? You want to say, okay, I want to add something in between. It will require shifting of remaining elements. That means that will take order of n time. Searching takes order n time. So by default, if you use the contains method, it's going to do linear search, right? But if you know the array list is sorted, then you can use your own binary search method or the binary search provided by the library function you can use that as well that searching will take log n time if your array list is already sorted right now let us look at basic syntax how we can create an array list array list uh, this is you have to define what kind of objects you want to store here right and then use okay i want to create a new array list object right so this is how we do it. For example, you can create an array list of strings and you say it's a new array list You can create an array list of integer, right? I told you it does not work with primitive data type. So you have to use other upper classes. Okay. So in general, I would uh, make this left data type to be of the list type because array list is a type of a list, right? And as a good design principle, it is preferred that we make this data type more general as possible so we can say okay the list uh, we are creating an object of the type list the implementation is given by new array list this is a more recommended thing to do right than doing array list right this you will learn in the design principles right so we'll create an object of the type list which which is implemented using the array list class right so this is what we will do right uh, so we can also use the constructor to give an initial capacity right so you can pass a number here that will tell me okay i want an array list whose initial size is 50 it is not going to be 10 so by default the initial capacity of the array list would be 50. that means until this array list is not full or it's not 70 percent full the doubling will not execute if you know that you are going to work with 10,000 elements create an array list of size 10,000 or 11,000 so that your doubling does not happen again and again because it's a expensive operation we can also initialize array list 
using an another list okay so you can give another list for example here we have a list of strings which is storing foo and bar and i'm going to initialize an array list with another list that is also possible so we have seen three ways the default constructor a constructor with the initial capacity and a constructor that ex accepts another list collection to initialize this array list right now one more cool thing about array list is we can also store objects of various types in this array list why so if you want to create an array list which can store objects of multiple different data types then don't parameterize the instance so you if you see here i've not specified any specific data type here that means this array list can store different object data types so i can add an integer right so i'm saying array list dot add integer dot value of one now you might ask why i cannot do this array list dot add one because it is of the type int right so i need to type cast this into integer data type integer dot value of is a method that creates a integer object out of this one right string dot value of scalar so this is optional we can simply say array list dot add scalar so it's it's going to add a string object inside my array list right if i show you in the demo i have created an array list here i say okay array list dot add integer dot value of one this is going to add an integer and then array list dot add scalar so i'm storing an integer object and a string object inside the same array list right so this is also possible right so you see the output here right let us talk about some more methods of array list so predefined methods include lot of methods so there are methods for adding objects so if i simply call the add method it will add at the end of the list there is a add method which also accepts an index and an ob object it will insert into a specific index of the list right there is a add all method it will uh, add another list in another collection into this list right so we can also add another collection at a particular index in this list so let us look at uh, the add methods first so i can say i want to create an array list so list of its integers i call it as list and this is equal to new array list you can see we have imported the list interface and we have imported the array list class now inside this list i need to add some numbers i can say add one add two add four so let me show you and if i print this list i see i get one two four i have added these numbers okay now what i can do i can add at a particular index as well i can say okay i want to add at a certain index so either i give a integer or i give a int followed by a integer i can say okay add at index 2 the element is 15 if i do it it will do insertion in the middle of the list that is also possible so you can see i get 15 which is now present at index 2 so by default it is uh, like the first parameter is is the index the second parameter is the value that i am going to insert right that is the add function i can create another list as well i can say okay um, i need another list list 2 and i can say list 2 dot add 15 and i can or let's say this is 25 i can also add all elements of list 1 in list 2 i can say list 2 dot add uh, list so i can pass another collection here so add all so i need to call the add all method and this will also work and i can print list 2 as well so you can see i am uh, having 25 here followed by all ele elements of list 1 that is how do we use the add method next we will look at look at the remove method so now remove method is it's actually a overloaded method if you look at uh, we have we can pass a object we can also pass an index now this becomes tricky especially if you are working with integers right if i say okay i want to remove something i want to say uh, list 2 dot remove 1 now what does it mean am i removing the index or am i removing the value 1 right so uh, or let me just say list dot remove 1 so if i talk about first list and i want to remove 1 from it so let me show you it will actually remove the index because 
when you are passing one simply like this it's going to assume it is of the data type int right so if you look here right? so when i pass int data type it removes the index at the at, at the following index it will remove so that means it will remove the element 2 from list 1 but if i want to remove the value that is 1 what will i have to do i have to convert that into an integer object right so i have to say list dot remove integer dot value of 1 that means remove 1 as a uh, object so if i remove both let's say so that means 1 and 2 both will get removed let me show you the output i'll print system s out uh, list show me what you're going to remove right so now you can see the output that both 1 and 2 they got removed and we got 15 and 4 similarly you have a remove all method which will accept another collection it will remove all elements from that collection from the given collection clear will remove all elements from the list contains will tell me whether a particular element is present or not so i can check that okay if list contains 15 do something right so contains is, is is your linear search so s out uh, yes 15 is present something like this so you can use the contains method with almost every collection let me run this and you can see that we are getting 15 is present okay so there are more methods uh, so there is a get method so if you want to read a particular index you want to say okay show me what is present at uh, the zeroth index you can say s out or you can maybe you want to iterate over the entire array list you can say for int i equal to zero i less than list dot size or list two dot size i plus plus i want to get the elements at each index you can say s out list two dot get i this will give you the elements at given ith index so get function is used to access the ith element so let me run this and you can see we are able to iterate over all the elements in this list so just like get there is another method that is called set so if you want to update a particular index you want to say okay i want to make this zeroth element as 50 so you can say okay list to dot set zeroth element make it 50 this will up work and now your zeroth element will be 50 you need to give the index and the object that is that you need to store here this is the set function there are more methods i won't be able to cover all the methods but we have covered like most of the important methods there is a method called to array if you want to get an array from an array list you can use this and there is a method called as size which we have just seen there is also a method called trim to size that means if we have if we want to reduce the current size right like if we want to reduce the capacity to the current size we can use this method trim to size right these are some of the important methods uh, associated with uh, array list there is also index of returns the index of the first occurrence of the specified element in the array list or minus one if it does not contain the element so contains is going to give you boolean present or not index of is going to give you at what index it is present or not right now we'll look at some more ways to iterate on the array list let's do a quick demo so we have seen a for loop we can also use a for each loop so i can say for every uh, integer x in my list two I want to access it and I want to print it. So I can say okay, s out list to dot get i. That is my another way of iterating and printing. So sorry, I will not do this. I'll say okay, let me print this number x. Let me run this code. There is one more way that I can also iterate on the list using an iterator. Right. So you can see we are getting. Uh, all the elements that is 1 2 15 4 and 50 is also there right so we are starting from 50 here and we are getting all these elements okay so iterator is one more way to traverse on 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 a java collection all java collections they they support iterators so what you can do you can create a iterator object by calling list dot iterator this iterator has a method called as has next which tells me whether i can access the next element in the collection or not or not right if your collection has finished your has next will give you okay there is no other element right so i can say while it dot has next 
if there is an element present i can access it so i can say okay s out it dot next this will give me the next element in the collection this is another way using which i can iterate on given collection right so iterator is coming from the java.util uh, package only right so this will also print all the elements present in this error list let us quickly run the code and see so we are getting the same output uh, using iterator as well so we i iterated on list 1 so which is 15 and 4 again i iterated using iterator which is 15 comma 4 that is what i am getting by iterating on my list that's all for array list i hope you understood the methods of array list and how it works now let us jump into linked list so linked list is also a linear data structure in which elements are represented as objects and stored in non continuous memory for example if this is your heap memory and you have some data maybe one is stored here two is stored here three is stored here four is stored here they might form a chain like structure and where each object is referring to the is holding the address of the next object in the chain this is called as a single linked list where each object knows the address of the next node but it does not know anything about the previous nodes so if you arrive at three you can only go to four if you arrive at four you can only go in the forward direction let us talk about linked list little more so we don't have to specify the size of the linked list it's a dynamic data structure as you add more data more objects get created in the memory and they become part of the chain and size is changing automatically as the data is added or removed so you don't need any fixed size array to initialize it right now let's talk about the implementation as i just talked about each node in a linked list it's it's going to hold data it is also going to hold the address of the next node and if it is a doubly linked list it is also going to hold the address of the previous node the nodes are not stored in a continuous memory location they are linked to each other with the help of next and previous pointers okay so this is something we'll go into the detail when we talk about uh, when we do a tutorial on linked list but for now we just want to see how to use the inbuilt linked list class and understand its advantages and when to use it right so in java the default implementation provides us with a doubly linked list so a doubly linked list each node stores three things the object or the data the next node's address and the previous node's address so at two you know where is the next node located and where is the previous node located at three you know where is the next node located and where is the previous node located so you know all the three things at each node inside a linked list that is what a doubly linked list is right and creating a doubly linked list is fairly simple so you just need to use the linked list class provided by the java.util package and the data type what kind of data you want to store in this linked list and it will create a linked list for you right now let's talk about the features of the linked list the biggest feature is we can use the non continuous memory so if you don't have a linear block available we can still create a big chain by utilizing the non continuous blocks of the memory it is a dynamic data structure there is no need to pre allocate the memory and hence it re results in efficient utilization of the uh, memory as well right and insertion and deletion at the ends of the linked list are performed in constant time now this is a very big advantage so if you have an array and you want to insert something at the beginning you would see that i will have to shift the entire array then i can insert a zero here right but in case of a linked list this time which is order n in an array inserting at the beginning it's going to be very fast suppose you have one two three four five you already know this node okay and you say i want to insert a zero here so you create a new node and you say okay head should point here and zero should point here this can be done in order one time similarly the last node is uh, referred by a tail pointer if you want to create something at tail you can simply add six here and your tail will move here right so if it is a doubly linked list insertion and deletion both at the both ends can be just done in order one time this is a very very big advantage of linked list and concatenation of two linked lists is much more efficient in terms of space and time so if you want to merge two array lists you will have to copy all the data right but if you want to merge two lists let's say i have another list 7 8 and 9 in that case merging is also very easy you just need to connect this node with this one which is again going to take order one time concatenation is also very fast in case of a linked list right 
so let's talk about uh, the differences between the operations right so random access now that means if i want to get any ith element this is very fast in array right so i know i can get uh, i can do array dot get i this works in order one but if you want to get some uh, ith element inside a linked list there is no direct way you have to iterate it right? So in the worst case it will be order of n insertion and deletion at the beginning in case of linked list as i told you it's order one in an array it's going to be order n because you have to do the shifting insertion and deletion at the end so if it is a doubly linked list uh and we are maintaining the tail pointer you can do it in order one time as well and uh, in array it is also order one so this this can be made order one right it depends upon the implement insertion and deletion from the random location so of course this inserting deleting something from the middle both in array and a linked list will take order of n time right? so i hope you understood the basics of a linked list now let's look at the implementation so i have this code in which we said okay we are creating a list which is using a new array list object so instead of now using array list i can simply replace it with with linked list and since both array list and linked list implement the list interface so all the methods that we saw uh, with this list they will also work with linked list as well right so i need to import this class let me just type linked list and this will get imported so import java.util.link so this is also there right? if i run this code as it is the same array list code it will work all the methods that we used on array list will also work on linked list as well right now apart from it there are some additional methods as well which are provided by linked list for example adding something at the beginning of the list so that method is not there in array list we can use that method for example i can say uh, this dot add first i can say okay in the beginning you add an element that is zero you might be saying okay we are getting an error here at first there is nothing like this now why we why we are uh, getting this error because add first is not a method inside the list int okay so what happens is your list says that okay you must implement an add method whereas your linked list class which implements your list interface right it says okay i will implement the add method i will also implement the add first method that means you cannot call add first method on on a list kind of a variable right it, it is of the type list what i need to do i need to say okay the object that i am now creating is exactly a linked list okay if i make it linked list you can see add first will work because you can easily add in the beginning of a linked list i can say okay maybe add uh, minus 20 here and show me this list so i am running the code and you can see minus 20 is there it's added in the beginning of the list so we have more methods let's look at some more methods all right so just to save time i'll quickly uh, go through all of these methods so there is a add method which we saw on the list this is also there add all is also there add all we have seen right now add first i just show you showed you the demo it adds uh, the desired element in the beginning of the list similarly there is a add last method it will add at the end of the list so it will work same as your uh, add method there is a clear method which is fine there is a clone method creates a shallow copy there is a contains method element present or not it right? uh, then popular methods are get i want to get particular element works in a linear time get first get the first element get last get the last element index of you can use right now there is also a method called as offer right this method is used to add at a specified element at the tail of the list now you might be asking what is the difference between add versus offer so let us discuss this as well for that you need to go to the java linked list class right so i'm look uh, java linked list the oracle docs right so if i look look here what is happening uh, the linked list class it, it actually implements uh, not just your uh, list interface it also implements your tech interface it also implements your queue interface that means all the methods of the queue all the methods of deck they should be available as a part of linked list so what is deck a deck is a doubly ended link uh, it's a doubly ended 
Q. So that means you can do push and pop. That means you can add from the rear end, add remove from the rear end. And you can also do push and pop. That means you can add from the front side and also remove from the front side of the queue. That means insertion and deletion can happen at the both ends of the queue. Now, in order to uh, implement this deck interface or the queue interface, let us look at what all methods are there in the deck interface. Inside the deck interface, you see there are methods. You want to insert something at the beginning. There is a add first method that should be implemented by that class. If you want to remove something, the remove first should be there. If you want to get something, get first should be there, right? Similarly, uh, for the last element, add last, remove last, and get last should be there. Now there are two versions of the same method. One is add first, one is offer first, right? What is the difference between add first and offer first? So the difference is written here. So what they are saying is that both methods are provided to insert, remove and examine the element. Each of these methods exist in two forms. One throws an exception if the operation fails. The other returns a special value. So basically your offer method, it returns like true or false or null if your operation fails, right? Whereas add first will throw an exception. So it again depends upon your use case, how you want to use this method. If you're working in an environment where your capacity of the data structure is restricted and you are trying to insert something and your data structure is already full, so what do you want? Should I, should it return false that I cannot execute this operation or should it throw an exception? If you want to throw an exception, go with the add first method. If you want to handle it using a value like true, false or null, you will have to go with the offer first method. Because linkless implements the queue and the deck interface, which needs these methods. Hence, you will see there are many methods which are doing the sa almost same work, right? Between add and offer, there is a difference of the return type. Should you not the return type, but how do you handle the failure case, right? So you are going to return a, something like true false, or should I throw an exception, right? So that is offer, and we have offer first, we have offer last, right? Then there is a method peak. So peak means to look. I want to look at the element. So if you simply call peak, it will show you the first element of the linked list, the head of the linked list. Peak first fetches the head of the linked list. So peak and peak first, they are same. Peak last, show me the last element, right? Then there is a method poll. Poll means I want to uh, fetch the first element of the linked list. It, it will return the first element and remove it, right? Poll first is also same removes the first element or it, it's going to return null if the list is empty. Then there is poll last, it will remove and give you the last element of the linked list or it will give you null if the linked list is empty, right? There is a method called pop as well. Linked list can also be used as a stack. So in stack, we generally call removing the last element as pop, right? And push is also there. If you want to some push something in the stack, I can say, okay, I'm pushing something so it will push something into the linked list. If I say pop, it will remove the last inserted element from the linked list. Similarly, the, the remove method is there, right? Remove first is there, remove last is there, set is there, you want to update a particular element. And two string is there. That means if I want to print a linked list, it will call the two string method. And each element is separated by a comma and it is enclosed in square bracket. When, whenever we are printing this and when, whenever we, we are using system dot out dot print list, what is happening internally? It is using the two string method of the list object to give us list, which looks like this. Okay. This is coming from the, uh, two string method. So I hope you really got an idea on what all methods you can use on a linked list. So many methods are there. So mainly you need to remember that you can work on both ends. You can work on the front side, you can work on the rear end and you can also insert in the middle, search in the middle, but insertion and deletion at the ends, it is fast in the middle. It's difficult. Random access. It's difficult. It's going to take order of end time compared to an array. So that's all. I'll see you in the next data structure. Let's talk about stack. Stack is a very simple and easy to use data structure. So just like arrays and linked list, it is also a linear data structure that is used for storing data. And it looks very much like a real life stack, such as a stack of books, a stack of plates. And uh, let's see 
so it's kind of an ordered list in which insertion and deletion are done only at one end for example if you have items coming in one two three and you push them items into a stack so one will go then on the top of it two two will go and three will go and if you start popping items three will come first then two will come and then one will come so it's also called as last in first out data structure the element which is inserted at the last is the first one to get removed for example if you keep a stack of books you put a c++ book then you put a java book and then you put a python book python book is the one that you can pick first followed by java book followed by c++ book last in first out property stack has so internally if you want to uh, see how it is implemented you can use a fixed size array you can also use a dynamic array you can also use a linked list to implement a stack and how it is different from arrays arrays allows random access you can get any ith element but in case of stack of books you can only access the topmost element so uh, in a way there is a limited access possible and only topmost element is directly available in case of a stack stacks are generally dynamic in nature that means we don't have a fixed size and size can be increased or decreased depending upon the push and the pop operations that we are doing right so the container that you are using can be a fixed size array as well but in general it would be dynamic such as a dynamic array or a linked list so the operations on stack they are very simple you can push an element into the stack you can pop something from the stack and you can peek peek means you can look at the topmost element. let us look at a code demo to understand these operations well so in java we have a stack class which is uh, which also implements your uh, list interface but on the top of it stack has its own methods as well so let's look at a demo right so like i have created a stack object stack of string called books and in this i can push something so i can say books dot push right now you see there is a add method as well the add method is coming from the list interface or i can simply call push method which is specifically implemented by the stack class so i can say okay let me push c plus plus let me push java and let me push python let me just create three books and push it it's okay python now if i print the stack i can say okay show me what elements do we have so i call it as books let's run the code and suppose if i want to see the topmost element the topmost element will be what it should be a uh, python right if i want to look at the topmost element so i can simply call peak right so i can say okay uh, s out books dot peak that will give me python and if i want to remove it i can call the pop method i can say books dot pop that is going to remove the topmost element and now if i do peak i will see java next s out books dot and apart from these methods we also we, we can run a loop like we can say okay uh, while the stack is not empty i want to uh, stack dot sorry books dot is empty while this is not empty i want to keep on popping elements i want to remove them so i can say s out um, books dot peak and i want to pop everything books dot this is one way to iterate on the stack you have to remove all the elements and uh, yeah so i hope you are able to understand this example so we are able to remove all elements we first removed python then we removed java and then we removed plus plus as well that's all about stack a very simple data structure right and hopefully you will be able to use it let us talk about queue a queue again is a very simple data structure uh, it's just like a real life queue the sequence of object waiting to be served in the sequential order starting from the beginning of the queue so in general queue maintains a fifo kind of ordering but we also have something called as a priority queue which is little different for example a fifo queue would mean a queue of cars at a toll booth cars are coming in to get their ticket or people are standing in a line to buy their tickets what happens in general people enter from the rear end of the queue and they leave from the front side of the queue once they get the ticket so adding something in, into the queue it's called as n queue removing something from the queue is called as d queue someone has been removed from the queue 
So insertion, as I discussed, it happens at the rear end of the queue, whereas deletion happens at the front end of the queue. Last in, uh, last out. The person who is entering in the last is the last one to come out. Or you can say it's a FIFO, first in, first out. The person who is coming first is the first one to come out, right? The front of the queue is returned using a peak operation. So if you want to say, okay, I want to see who is at the front. The, the most libraries, they have a peak method. Like in Java, we have a peak method to see what element is at the front of the queue, right? And similarly, there are methods like offer to add something at the end of the queue. And if you want to remove something from the front side, it's called as poll. Right? We'll look at three methods, offer, adding something at the rear end, polling, removing something from the front side and peaking means looking what is at the front okay so peak only gives you the element whereas poll removes an element from the queue right so these are three methods that we will discuss if you want to implement a queue at your own end you can use a fixed size array uh, also known as a circular uh, array to implement the queue you can also use a dynamic array or also you can use a linked list right? so there are limitations of queue data structures a queue is not readily be searchable you cannot go inside the queue and search so you might have to maintain another queue to store the dequeued elements okay so you have to empty the entire queue if you want to search for something and uh, traversal of course we cannot traverse that is the same thing so you have to again remove all the elements to do the traversal and in this process queue becomes empty so these are limitations of the queue so uh, operations you want to add something so the equivalent java method it is called as offer i want to add something into the queue you want to remove something the java method it, it is called as poll and if you want to look who is standing at the front, the method is called as P. Let us look at the queue methods in our code demo. And if I talk about uh, what are the methods there in Java, right? So if, if I told you that queue is an interface in Java, right? So this interface is implemented by three different classes. One is called array deck, which stands for doubly ended queue. We can use linked list, which we will be using to implement our before queue and there is also something called as priority queue which we will also study very soon right we'll go with the linked list while implementation right the methods that i told you they are insert remove and examine Ex examine is like peak right now again i told you there are two two versions that java provides one set of methods that throws exception so if you use okay i want to add something into the queue there is a add method or if you want to do the same functionality, you can also use the offer method. The offer method returns a special value, whether your operation was successful or not. Add method might throw an uh, exception if your add operation fails because of some reason. Okay. Similarly, remove throws an exception. If your operation fails, poll will not throw an exception. Element, you, you're looking for an element maybe at the empty queue, right? It can throw an exception peak will not throw in this is how these methods are designed so i will be uh, going with these methods okay in the implementation let me jump into the code and let's quickly create a queue right well it's okay i want to create a queue of integers i call it as queue and i say okay the queue implementation so queue is an interface the implementation is provided by the linked list so we'll be using linked list for this queue right so we also need to import uh, import it now how do i do it i can say q dot add some numbers let's say one two three and four let me just copy this now if i say okay i want to see who is at the front of the queue or let's just print the entire queue let's uh, run this code and simultaneously let's see who is at the front of the queue so i can say s out q dot peak show me who is standing at the front i will see one is standing at the front so one came first right now if i remove this i say okay i want to remove one i can say q dot um poll and then i can say show me the entire queue and also show me the front element i can say q dot just like stack you can also use a while loop to empty all the elements of the queue so after removing one the queue is two three four 
and if i look at the front element the front element is now so you can put a loop like this while your queue is not empty you can keep on removing the elements from the queue that is all about queue i hope you really understood uh, how to use queue in java so next in line is the deck data structure so it stands for doubly ended queue and it's pronounced as deck so it is again a linear data structure that allows insertion and deletion at the both ends okay so you you can do insert here you can say okay i can expand in this side or i can also expand in this side maybe i insert 5 maybe i insert 12 or i can remove from both ends of the queue it's a queue that supports insertion and deletion at both ends so basically internally we can use a linked list to implement it and java also provides a special class called as array deck which implements the deck right so if i look at the hierarchy so we start with the collection interface we have seen the queue interface extends the collection interface it adds some more methods into the collection then there is also a deck interface which i have not shown earlier in the diagram and the array deck is a implementation of the deck interface right? array deck is implementing the class that implements the deck interface which is extending the queue interface okay so this is what you it's a good to know thing not mandatory right array deck and linked list are commonly used deck implementation if it is a double linked list you can see it is very easy to expand something on both the ends right so you can simply add something here as well and your tail will move right you can add something here as well your head will move right so it's pretty easy to use linked list but Aridic internal implementation is little more complicated. So I'll discuss few more points about Aridic. It is an implementation of the deck interface that uses a resizable array to store its element. And deck is a subtype of queue interface that we have just discussed. Best thing about Aridic class is it provides constant time performance for inserting and removing elements from both the ends of the queue. Now this is very tricky, right? In an array, we cannot do constant time insertion and deletion at both the ends we can do only at one end right but in deck in array deck it uses a internally some complicated mechanism so that we can remove and insert from both the ends of the queue and these operations can be done in order one time from both the ends right this is a very powerful feature of array deck that we must know right? now, talking about the operations right if you want to add something at the beginning you can say add first okay or you can use a method called as offer first these are two methods which are doing the same work there is a minute difference if due to let's say capacity limitation you don't have men memory or you're restricting the size of the queue and you're trying to add some element then add first will throw an exception will throw an exception just like other add methods we have discussed the offer method will return false that okay i could not return this element I could not add this element similarly we have remove first and poll first methods so remove will throw an exception poll will return true or false get first will throw an exception peak will tell me whether the element like if i could not get that element it will throw an exception peak will tell me null i could not remove that element that might happen right there is add first there is add last offer last remove last poll last get last peak last. Now, if you ask me what methods I would be using, I would be using offer first, poll first, peak first. So, if you want to do operations at this end, you want to add something, use offer first. If you want to remove something from the front, use poll first. And if you want to look at what is this element, you can use peak first. Right? Same operations, if you want to do at this end, what you will do you will say offer last i want to add something here i want to remove something from here i will say poll last and i want to see something what is this last element so i can say peak show me the last element this tech so that is about the operations of tech now let us look at a code demo of for deck so let us create a array deck object you can say array deck of let's say integer 
एक equals to deck and in this deck I can add elements I can say uh, offer so there is a offer method as well offer first is there offer last is there so I can say okay let me show you offer first let's say 12 deck dot offer first let's say 15 deck dot offer offer last let's say 20 deck dot offer let's say 30 let me show you what in what order the elements have been inserted s out i will say deck and let's run this code i'm getting 15 12 20 and 30 so first i had 12 offer first i said in the beginning i want to add something 15 gets added here then i say offer last 20 so 20 gets added here then i said offer 30 offer is actually behaving like offer last offer and offer last they are doing the same work this is how your deck is getting created similarly if you want to remove something you can call the poll method so you can say s out deck dot poll last give me the last element s out deck dot poll first give me the first element and uh, if you want to see now what is the new first element you can just call pick so you can say s out deck dot peak first show me the new first element and s out show me the new last element peak last let us run the code and see so this is our deck now i say uh, give me the last element so it removes 30 it's gone give me the first element it removes 15 it is gone show me the first element the first element is 12 show me the last element the last element that is how easy it is to work with deck and i hope you understood the concept let us talk about priority queues priority queue is a special type of queue in which each element is associated with a priority value for example if uh, people are standing in a queue and you might want to give priority to the senior citizens maybe age is a criteria in which people will get their tickets okay senior people will get their ticket first young people will get their tickets later so basically elements that we are going to serve in the queue they will be served according to a certain priority higher priority elements are going to be removed and it is up to you how do you define the priority okay maybe a big number has a more priority or maybe a lower number has a more priority we can have a max priority queue we have a min priority queue we can insert like people can join the queue right but maybe this is 16 years this is 20 years and this is maybe uh four years right now if i say okay i want to remove someone I'll remove the person with the maximum. I'll remove person 20, right? So this will get removed. So people can join the queue, but when I'm going to remove people, the people with the higher priority will get served first, right? So the underlying data structure for a priority queue, it's a heap. We can have a main heap or a max heap. I will not be able to dive into the details of heap at this point. We'll be looking at how do we use the Java priority. So the operations that are supported, we can insert something inserting in a queue it's called as a offer right? i can offer some data inside the queue i can look at if i want to see who is standing at the front of the queue that is called as peak and if i want to perform deletion i want to remove someone right from the queue that that is called as poll right? we'll be looking at these methods right? and insertion and deletion they are login methods looking who is at the front the so order one method right so let us do a quick code, code demo as well so we have uh, seen how to work with the queue this is the code for a queue a priority queue also is a class that implements the queue interface okay so right now it was a fifo queue now i'm going to change it to a priority queue right so rest everything will change so if you want to add add method will also work but if you want to use the offer method i can use the offer method as well I can say two dot offer some numbers uh, ten. We'll change the data later. If I have ten zero eight maybe seven and let's say uh, nine. Right now, if I say okay, I want to print the entire queue. Let's see what output do we really get. Okay, so I am getting this output zero seven eight ten and 
line now i want to look at what is the first element i'm in this case the lowest element it's getting priority right so you see zero is coming at the front of the queue rest of the queue is not actually sorted only the uh, priority element it comes to the front of the queue right so zero is there if i say okay i want to look at this element so this element is zero and i want to remove this element so it removes zero and now what is the next lowest element in the queue that is seven so seven comes to the front of queue if i make it 17 then the next lowest would be eight right so let's let me run it once again now i have zero nine eight seventeen and ten the lowest element it is at the front right then I, if i remove zero the next lowest is actually eight so that comes to the front so if i remove that element or if i look at what is that element i get that element eight. using the peak operation you can see the element using the pole operation you can remove the priority element now you might ask if i want to reverse the order okay uh, so in that case you can pass one more par com comparator so i can say okay comparator dot reverse order this is exactly going to reverse the comparison a min priority queue becomes a max priority queue so in this case the highest element it's going to get a priority right so now you look at 17 is standing at the front if we remove 17 10 is standing at the front and there is no specific order for rest of the elements that is unpredictable we are only worried about the element at the front should be either the min element or the max element this is about priority queue in java let us talk about a set interface now so what is a set mathematically it is a collection of elements that cannot contain duplicate elements okay uh, so set in java it models the mathematical set abstraction now the set interface that we have seen it contains only the methods inherited from the collection so that means there are no additional methods inside the set interface all the methods are inherited from the collection but it adds the restriction that the duplicate elements are prohibited everything all the methods which are there in collection right the same methods are there in set except the condition that duplicate elements cannot be present there are three classes in java that provide the implementation of set there is hash set there is link set linked hash set and there is preset so let us try to understand the differences between the three implement so as i discussed there is hash set tree set and linked hash set so hash set stores the elements in, inside a hash table it is the best performing implementation however it makes no guarantees regarding the order of iteration you say okay i inserted 10 20 15 18 inside the set and if you start uh, iterating over the elements you are not guaranteed to get any order you might get 20 18 10 and 15 so the elements will come out in any random order right so it does not ensure any kind of ordering on the hash set the internal data structure is a hash table and there is a linked hash set so it is implemented again as a hash table and along with the hash table we maintain a linked list so that means these elements are going inside the hash table but also we uh, like chain them together so that we are able to maintain the order of insertion so it has implemented a hash table with a linked list running through it so it combines the features of hash table and a linked list and orders its elements based upon the order in which they were inserted so basically it maintains the insertion order okay so it's going to give you the features of the hash set along with the ordering that is maintained there is one more thing that is called tree set it stores the elements in a red black tree so red black tree is a self balancing binary search tree which is a height balanced tree and it orders its elements based upon their values and it is subsequently slower than the hash set basically whenever we talk about bst right and it is a height balance bst so if you have to do an insertion searching inside in such a tree where the tree height is log n so it's going to take uh, all the methods like inserting data finding data they are going to take order of log n time inside a preset whereas on hash set and linked hash set the time complexity is going to be order one on average right so basically the advantage of tree set is that it keeps your data sorted linked hash set keeps the same order as input hash set it is the fastest and it is the but it does not give us any guarantees on the order so these are three different implementations of set in java
let us look at the code demo for uh, hash set okay if i want to create a set let's say set of integers s this is equal to new hash set right now i want to do something on this let us import as well right? java.util.set the import has been done let us add few numbers into it it says set dot add uh, sorry s dot add some numbers it's a 10 s dot add 20 s dot add 18 and s dot add let's say 18, right and s dot add 40. So i've added few numbers so let me display s s out the set let us run this code and see what do we get so i'm getting 18 20 40 10 and 15 you see the order is random there is no fixed order 18 20 40 10 15 so it's it's kind of a random order right if i want to add like if i add a duplicate element once again so if i say okay add 10 once again and if i run this code you will see this it will not store the duplicate elements only one 10 is stored even if i add it one, once again the duplicates get filtered out so no duplicates are, al are allowed in the set right suppose i want to remove an element so i can say s dot remove 40 right this will remove 40 from the set and uh, what is not there right? and suppose if i want to check if a particular element is present or not so if i can say s dot contains uh, some number 20 so you can say yes it is present or i can simply say uh, just do s out whether 20 is present or not so s out s dot contains so it will give me true or false whether this element is present or not so i will get a true here right so 20 is present these are the three fundamental methods add remove and contains and if you remember these are the methods they were part of collection interface as well we can use these methods on any uh, any data structure that we have seen so far right and all of them they inherit from the uh, collection interface uh, there are few more methods we, which we have with the collection interface is empty we can check size how many elements are there in the set clear remove all elements from the set and uh, we'll also see how do we use set with custom objects so let me first first show you the size method how many elements are there in this set so currently we have four elements so this method will uh, tell me okay there are four methods but okay. so there are four elements inside it now we have worked with a set of integers sometimes we might have to work with a set of a complex class maybe a set of books set of students a set of uh, payment ids or set of debit cards right anything anything can come here so data type can be anything so let us see how do we implement set with a custom data type and what will change okay before we uh, discuss the custom set there is one more thing so we just discussed that okay we can use a hash set class in java but we can also use linked hash set and we can also use tree set so i'll comment this out and i'll show you two more examples instead of creating a hash set i can create linked hash set in java and if i use this you will see i will be able to maintain the same order as insertion in this set so if i remove 40 i will get 10 20 18 and 15 so this for this follows the order of insertion right? and if i use something like a tree set that is slower because it uses uh, self balancing binary search trees doing add and remove it's going to take login time on a tree set but it's going to maintain elements in a sorted order so let's see that as well now the elements are sorted in the set because we are using a tree set so i hope you are able to understand the differences between hash set link set and tree set now we will move into a set with a custom class set of custom objects let's see that now let us discuss how do we use set with a custom class now suppose you want to create a set of books what i have done i have defined a book class in which book has three properties isbn name and price as the attributes of a book what i am doing i want to create a set in which every item is of the type book now let us uh, insert few books in, into this hash set i can say books dot add let's say i want to create a new book each book should have a name uh, ISBN which is a unique code and let's say the price of the book 
and let me say okay i'm going to add few more books and here i make the name as let's say java isbin is 2 and let's say i change the price right now if i let's say go and run this code let us see how many um, books we will have so s out um, books dot size and let's say s out books i also want to see what are the books that the set is storing so i am storing three books and you can see c++ book is getting stored twice right? and java book is coming once now why, why is this happening why it is not able to filter out that these two books are really same the reason is we are creating this object using new right so for the set to know whether these two objects are same or no there is no way right so we are creating a new object that will treat that these these are two different objects created at two different memory locations maybe this is 1056 this is 2080 so for, for set these two books are different because they are two different objects in the memory right we need a way to tell this set that okay you should consider these two objects as same in order to do that one thing we need to do is we need to define so internally it is using uh, the concept of hashing right so it's going to compute the hash code for an object you have to tell me how do I compute the hash code? So for that, I need to uh, override a method which is called as a hash code. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to override a method called as a hash code. In this case, if I want to compute the hash code of a book, maybe I want to say, okay, compute it only on the basis of ISBN. ISBN is a unique number. Right? So let me do it once again now. Let's see if something changes or not. So again, it is not changing. So when I'm hashing the books, Although the books are getting hashed on the basis of ISBN, still the set does not know whether the two books are equal or not. So what happened? We uh, computed the hash code for this book, inserted it into the set. This book went into the set. We again computed a hash code for this book. It also went into the set. Two objects, they can have the same hash code. That is okay. And uh, the thing is, I need a way to tell the set, consider these two objects are equal. So maybe, I want to say that uh, so I need to uh, provide a method that is called as equals method. Okay. So let's see how do we write this method. So there is a pretty standard template to do it. So whether two objects are equal or not. So whenever you are inserting a new object, let's say you are inserting this object into your hash set, it's going to compare that whether such an object is present or not. So why, at what location it's going to compare? It's going to uh, compute the hash code and it's going to check whether we have uh, something at that location or not. So suppose C++ was there, some other book Python was there. Suppose they two, two had the same hash code. So it's going to compare whether these two are equal or not, whether these two are equal or not. So this concept will be a little more clear if you understand the technique of separate chaining. Right? Different objects, they can have a same hash code if they have the same ISBN or the hash function is producing the same value for two different numbers as well. It can happen, right? But what we need to do is we need to tell that, okay, the two objects are equal if their ISBN is same. Right? So what I will do is, uh, what I have done here is I'm saying that, okay, um, you're, I'm giving you an object. So I say, okay, book B1, compare this object equal to B2. They're, they're two, uh, these two objects are equal in like two, three scenarios. I'll discuss what are those scenarios. Suppose I create a book B1 which is equal to new book and I say okay B2 is a book which is equal to B1 so in this case what is happening I have just one book object both B1 and B2 they are pointing to same right if B I if I make any change in B1 it will also affect in B2 so what I'm doing that if this is equal to O that means if the current object and the other objects they are referring to the same memory that means they are equal right if O is null, if one of the object is null, they cannot be equal. Or if the two objects, they belong to the different class. So suppose if I compare a book with a student, they can never be an equal. I am returning false. Otherwise, any given object, I typecast this into book class. And then I compare that is the ISBN of my book is equal to the ISBN of other book. If this is the case, consider the two book objects to be equal. If I add this equals method, my hash set will come to know that okay these two books they have the same ISBN I will not insert them again even if I 
now now look i have only two books okay and c++ is stored only once now even if i change the name of this book i say okay this is c++ version 2 and the price has been increased to 120 will hash set store this book the answer is no because it is only going to compare on the basis of isbn if isbn is same i will not again store this book right but if you want okay the two books are equal if their name is same if their price is same if their isbn is same then in the equals method you can have two more conditions along with the isbn that i should match all the three parameters for the comparison the equals method is important so you need to override this method to tell the set in what scenario you should consider two objects as equal so i hope you're getting it and uh, that's all for this implement let us talk about the final data structure that is a map a map contains values on the basis of a key that means it contains information in the form of key value pairs just like a restaurant menu whenever you go to a restaurant you say okay i want to have a burger and you immediately get to know the burger is 50 i want to have a pizza the pizza is 200 i want to have a coke the coke is let's say 70 there is a key there is a value associated a map contains unique keys that means i cannot have a burger twice in my menu Okay, a map is useful if you have to search, update or delete elements on the basis of key. So we do not ask, okay, what item is after burger or what item is coming before pizza. The ordering is not that important to us. What is important that given a key, what is the value associated with that, that item? And I want to, okay, Coke is out of stock. So I want to delete this key value pair or something new has come up. I want to insert that key value pair. Right? For operations like these map is a very good useful powerful data structure and most of these operations they run in order one on average so search is order one on average update is order one on average delete is order one on average so very powerful data structure now uh, let us uh, talk a bit more about map java platform contains three general purpose implementations one is your hash map another is your tree map another is your linked hash map so the behavior and the performance is same as the way hash set, tree set and link set work, right? So hash map internally uses a hash table. It's the technique called separate chaining that is used to implement a hash map. So to understand hash map, we'll do a separate video where we'll dive into the internals of a hash map. Tree map is like a self-balancing binary search tree and linked hash map is your hash table. And it also maintains a linked list of the elements in which uh, like it changes the elements through the linked list as well uh, in the order in which they were inserted. So it's more complex than a hash map. Map does not allow duplicate keys. Just like a hash set, we do, cannot have duplicate elements, but we can have duplicate values. For example, burger can cost 50. Noodles can also cost 50. The value can be duplicated, but the key must be different, right? Hash map and linked hash map, they allow null keys and values, but tree map does not allow null key or a value, right? Tree map, you cannot store a null key. A map cannot be traversed. So you cannot directly iterate on the map. So you need to convert it into set using key set or entry. This we will look into the code demo. Talking a bit more about uh, the hierarchy in Java. There is a map interface. Okay. And hash map is an implementation for the map interface. Right? There is a linked hash map, which builds on the top of your hash map class. Right? Hash map is a class. Linked hash map is also a class. Tree map is a class that implements your sorted map interface. Sorted map interface is again a uh, child interface of map, right? It, it kind of extends that map. Here, ordering is important. Right? You get the uh, keys in a sorted order. Here, you get keys in the order in which they were inserted. And hash map, it is the fastest. Here, you don't get any ordering on the key. This is the difference between the implementation. Also, uh, the operations are order one here on average the operations on tree map they are order of log n on average why because it is using a self-balancing binary search tree okay? okay so here i have implemented a map object by using the hash map class right so i've created a map called as menu and i'm going to add certain items in so i can say menu dot add it's a uh, the item is dosa and the price is 200 menu dot add let's say the item is burger the price is 50 we are getting a error here so the method is called as put hash map we don't have the add method because it does not inherit the collection interface okay i told you map is separate from um, 
app interface is not uh, it's not a child interface for of collections interface okay, so it has method called put it does not have a method called add so i can put key value pairs like this i can say menu dot put noodles and maybe some price and here i can say s out show me the menu let's see if we get something here so let's see what do we get if i run this code in the meanwhile i will write down some more methods so i can see there are i can see the uh, list of key value pairs that are stored inside this map i can also remove something i can say menu dot remove i give burger i just need to give the key the burger will get removed from the map i can also search that if my menu contains some item like dosa i can say contains key this is the method and i can check whether it is present so you can say yes key out uh, s out dosa found so you can do this as well but after removing burger we have two items noodles and dosa in our map right so dosa is there so dosa found it's get it, it gets printed now let us also talk about how we can iterate on the map there are multiple ways right so what we can do is okay i just uh, written the three ways to iterate so that we can save some time so the way one is i can do i can create an object of the type map dot entry and this object is uh, iterating over uh, all so map menu dot entry set is a method that gives me the list of key value pairs where each key value pair is considered as an entry right I'm saying okay give me all the entries and given any entry i want to get the key and i want to get the value so that is one way so you are printing the first entry the second entry and then the third entry that is one way another way is if you want to just get the keys of the map you can say okay menu dot key set so it will give me all the keys like dosa burger noodles and you are iterating over these keys those keys are things then you can say okay i want to iterate over the values that are 250 70 i just want to iterate over these values so you can call the method called menu dot values and it will give you a set of values and you can iterate over this set using a for each loop and for every value you can print it i'll just run this code and show you the output you can see i'm able to iterate over the uh, uh, keys i'm able to iterate over the values and i'm also able to iterate over uh, key value pairs right so this is coming from this loop right and apart from it there are some more functions which can come handy so you can i would suggest and try those methods is empty whether the map is empty or not size how many elements we have here clear out everything in the map right this is clear method is helpful if you are working with multiple test cases every time you have to load new items and discard the previous items from the hash map instead of destroying the object and creating a new object it's better to clear out everything from the previous map so then there is get or default if the key is found you want to return some value uh, you want to return the value or if the key is not present you want to return some default value this is something you can use so for example i can say menu dot get uh, let's say uh, pizza so pizza i have not inserted if the pizza is not there i can say the default value is let's say zero that means um, in this case i will get an answer that is zero s out this value right what i'm getting i'm getting zero that means pizza is not present the default value if the item is not present i think the default value for that item is zero i can also say uh, i want to put pizza if it is not there so menu dot put if absent i can say okay it will first check if the item is not there if pizza is not there put pizza inside the map and put the value of pizza as 200 if i go and run this now it will first insert pizza because it's not there so it's basically using the put method with the condition and now if if i inquire about give me the price of pizza now the pizza is present because we have added it and i'm getting the pizza price as that's all for map right and now what you can do is you can also have a custom uh, class here you can also have something more complex here for example list of integers list of books key can be of any type value can be of any type but if you're using a custom key again you will have to overwrite your hash code method and the equals method just we did in the case of hash set as well one more thing we can do is if you um, want to replace this with a linked hash map you can do that everything will remain same 
and your ordering will also be maintained and you can also uh, replace it with a tree map if you want everything will remain same except the internal structure will be now uh, it will be using a self balancing um, bst right so you can also do a tree map kind of a stuff here we need to import it uh, tree map map is the code will work fine except now the elements will be sorted according to their um, keys right so that's all for this video if you found the video helpful make sure you hit the like button share it with your friends and subscribe to the channel i'll see you next time